You're listening to the Outpost Podcast with Dr. Ray Mitch. Hi, everyone. Hope you're having a good Sunday day. And uh, you are listening to the Outpost Podcast with Dr. Ray Mitch, and uh, that is me, the host. Thanks so much for joining me. I know that uh, time out of your day is a precious commodity, and so taking the time to listen is an honor and a privilege. And so I I very much appreciate that you've taken the time to listen in and uh, uh, get to know a little bit of... um, the vision and mission of uh, Stained Glass International and um, the various topics that I want to take some time to talk about. So in light of that, just for people that are listening in for a very first time and really don't care about small talk, um, The Outpost is a podcast that's exploring the intersection of uh, spiritual formation and psychology and uh, faith. And uh, as I have often commented on in other podcasts, is that that um, that intersection is often unexplored. We would much rather oftentimes be in um, one street rather than at the intersection because it's so much easier. It can f- finds the, the topic that we're trying to talk about and look at. But I think that the tension that raises in trying to look at these things creatively and look at them uh, with a an eye for uh, what God reveals about us and about his character in us and his image in us, I think is very important in light of certainly um, the topic that we're talking about, and that's grief and loss for the next couple of, of more episodes. It's an important topic. It's way more important than I think most people give it credit. Uh, it, an, important enough to, to uh, have our scripture be devoted to that in whole books. I mean, the whole book written by the prophet Jeremiah is called Lamentations or Lament. And there are psalms of lament. And there are a variety of models, if you will, of lament. So for that much time and attention being given to that topic, I think it's probably worth our while to spend some time looking at it and talking about it. But ultimately, Outpost, the the podcast itself, is really meant to encourage people to take the space um, no matter where they are, whether they're doubting or wounded or beat up and beat down or feel like their lives are a disappointment to God or whatever that might be, um, this is hopefully going to initiate the conversation around that and around uh, moving toward hearing what God might actually have to say, including the, uh, the, the, the sorrow you feel and and. Oftentimes when we feel sorrow, we feel really, really alone. And God's, either we want to shake our fist at God and get mad at him because he didn't, he didn't do anything. Um, or just, it, it's like we blame him for the things that have happened. Or any number of other things. I'm not going to try to create or go down the list. But what we want to do is create a place where people will actually meet the biblical Jesus, not the ones that oftentimes Christians uh, represent very, very poorly. So that's that's our effort. That's my effort in doing this podcast. Uh, I started out the, the year on this topic for a couple of different reasons. The, probably the biggest dog in the fight, if you will, uh, is, is uh, that I am launching a new book called The Seasons of Our Grief. It is now available on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and at our store, uh, uh, our store or digital store on sgi-net.org. So uh, you can you can visit there. You can see all the, the podcasts and the video uh, podcasts that has been released. All of those resources are there. And the one thing I know, and ironically, 
at least in the calendar of CCU and my teaching calendar, grief and loss is the first thing I teach at the beginning of every year. And I think that's pretty apropos because with each passing year, we're moving farther and farther away from people we've lost. And and so oftentimes our thoughts will return to those people. And certainly the holidays does it. And then, then we march our way into January and life picks up and demands pick up. And, um, and, and it's like, uh, you know, I, I, somehow I got to find a way to catch up with my soul in a lot of ways. So the beginning of the year is really, a, I think, a pretty appropriate topic to talk about in terms of grief and loss. And, and the, the question I want to pose to you, and maybe you've never heard this term before, but um, it, it dawned on me as I was listening to a sermon this morning by our, one of our pastors, and and I, I'm thinking about it. I'm in that mode, of course, because I'm teaching a class. But there's a class that I teach every fall called Shame and Grace. And the question is this, have you ever heard of the term force multiplier? Force multiplier. Um, actually, it is most often applied in military circles because there are um, machines. For example, you know, for the longest time, um, uh, battles were fought on foot. And then horses were introduced, and horses were a force multiplier. They increased the effect of a, a fighting force. And then the next thing that happened was catapults and uh, a variety of machinery of war, if you want to put it that way. And then you, we got to uh, tanks and a variety of things that really make it uh, more a force to have a greater impact. Well, what I want to propose to you to think about, and we'll get into this more in a minute, is that shame is a force multiplier for grief. And it complicates it. It tempts us into thinking that there is a perfect way to do grief instead of a human way to do grief. And it tempts us into looking for a, a playbook, if you will. And so that's that's one area that I want to try to address. The other one I want to put in here, and it, and it occurred to me as I've been doing this, and I've been talking about this for so long, is that there are three things that that I want to emphasize in talking through these seasons of grief. And the the first one, which is is unique, and in the sense that the prevailing conversations that you will have with virtually anyone is talking about stages of grief. And while, uh, well, let me back up. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, in her last book, said that she never intended those to be seen in a linear way. She never intended that. The problem is, as I would say, that she didn't necessarily take into account our uh, abiding um, commitment to bring order out of chaos and grief feels very chaotic. And so the way I can bring order to it is to have these stages I go through, I check the box when I get through them, and then I get to the end and I'm done. And while her intent was not for that, that is how we are using it. And that's what, to some degree, my book is a revolt against that. I, I really dislike that idea because it it does people a disservice because they think that they can go through these stages and then it's all done and it isn't and and then they get disappointed and then other kind of voices come into the into the landscape about what am I doing wrong and what should I do to get it right and blah 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 and all of those things and that is the voice quite honestly it is the voice of shame and shame, we are so marinated in it, we just don't even see it. And that's a force multiplier when it comes to dealing with our grief. So what I want to propose thinking about are three things. And, and you know, I've done enough preaching 
that uh, there's something to an alliteration. Um, and an alliteration, the words all start with the same first letter, and it makes it easier to remember, right? And so my concept and the thing that I like to talk about with the seasons of grief are tasks that, and, and the, the tasks that I have to, to what I want to say, the tasks that I have to kind of accomplish, if you will, uh, of course, that can still tempt us into, you know, being very linear about it and and checklistish about it. But at the same time, there's there's something to accomplish. And even in life development, when when you watch kids grow, there are milestones along the way when they accomplish certain tasks. Now they don't bend all of their attention to overcoming. Uh, you know, their uh, stranger anxiety. They, you know, it's, they're not racked with more anxiety because they have stranger anxiety. It doesn't work that way. But even as they grow, they accomplish certain tasks, and those tasks put certain things in place for them to accomplish the next one. And that's just, we just call it growth, you know, and development, at least in psychology. So we need to talk about tasks and traits the characteristics of each of these seasons, and then what tools do I have that I can use on the journey uh, through grief? And so tasks, traits, and tools. And each one I will spend time trying to unpack and helping, helping, helping you to understand not so much where you're at, but how to engage it well. It's because... The more we tend, I think, to focus on getting through it, the more we tend to um, short circuit the work that grief does for us in our own hearts and in our own development. And it's very important because it is a profound reminder of our humanity. And we live in a very broken world and we get reminded of it virtually every day, if not weekly, of the brokenness that we live in. And we get disappointed. Quite honestly, we just get disappointed. I'm tired of this fight that nothing ever seems to go as it should. And and again, just as a reminder, when I whenever I'm talking about shame, I, I oftentimes can detect it in people's language when they use the word should. It creates a condition that is impossible to meet, but we are still held to meeting that condition. And we do that with our grief as well. Is it's like it shouldn't go this way. Or another good example is I should be done with this by now. And, and those kinds of things are very sabotaging uh, on, on the journey through grief. And so last time, last two episodes that we went through some of these things, we looked at some of the misconceptions people have about it in terms of tears, in terms of uh, grieving is weakness, in terms of just uh, restraint, and and there's some kind of value in being restrained because of the impact it has on other people, rather than being true to our own hearts. Uh, the mi- misconception that once I start grieving, I will never be done, or it'll bowl me over to such a point that that I just won't be able to recover. And so, during the last episode, I talked a little bit about the scars we have, and those scars remind us of the healing that we went through, even though it was really uncomfortable. And I've had a couple different conversations over the last week about that same idea. Our scars are the things that we see, and they remind us of what happened. They are healed. There's no pain there anymore. Uh, but they they are they we're still changed we're still very changed and and that's the way grief works and so and that's also a part of why we need to do grief work we need to work our way through it now not work in terms of accomplishment but to engage it rather than to diminish it or minimize it or compare it or whatever else we tend to do okay so 
we looked at winter, and winter has a major characteristic or trait of denial in it. And we mentioned then that denial is not just this can't be happening or this isn't happening, although it's part of it, but it's also the meaning of the loss. It's the significance of the loss. That's all part of the denial. And, and, and the denial is actually a gift that allows us to emotionally catch up with our pain. And that's equally as important, you know, in terms of the going through the first season of our grief, and that's in winter. And we talked about some of the tools that we use. And just like we don't use a snowblower to rake leaves or mow the lawn, there are tools that can be used in the the winter of our grief and it includes journaling and listening to old music which seems like a masochistic thing to do or visiting old old haunts uh, you know that you shared with the person but again it as i pointed out that you know in some people have actually pointed to the fact that grief is a psychological burn wound. And the way that we heal a burn wound is oftentimes making sure that the wound stays clean and clear of anything that can be infecting it and keeping it from healing. And in times gone by, they would scrub the wound and the wound would weep. And that's our hearts too, is that we need to find ways to scrub the wound. We not only find out how much it has healed because it can, we can tolerate more of it, but we also it, it also hastens healing. And so that's the winter of our grief. The next, the next uh, uh, season that I want to talk about is the spring of our grief. And so the task in um, in the winter is to accept the reality of the loss that we've had, that the, that the person or uh, the dream or whatever is gone. It's not there. And, and just realize something. And the, one of the reasons I chose seasons is because of the cyclical nature of it. And there are, there are cycles even within a season so even in winter, like today, if, if we, I looked out the window, it was 50 plus degrees today. And you say, well, that sounds more like spring. And, it, and that's, yeah, exactly. For all I know, next, next week we could be in deep freeze and sub-zero temperatures or snow. And that's really, I think that's a very vivid metaphor of how grief happens to us and how we engage it and how we go through it. So spring begins to to dominate the picture and winter is accepting the loss and is accepting the pain the the reality of the loss. But spring is the to acknowledge and work through the pain that we have. So it's surveying the landscape of my pain and and my woundedness over what has happened in the loss. Now, there are three key areas in this that I want to just highlight for you. And now this is where traits come in. The task is acknowledge and work through the pain. The traits has a physical component to it. It has a a cognitive component, and and if you're not familiar with that term, cognitive is, is how we think and how we frame the world. And it has an emotional component to it as well as a behavioral one. So you've got physical, you've got behavioral, and then you've also got cognitive that shows up during this time probably more vividly than they do during winter. Although there are probably, well, no, it's not probably, there are hints of, of, of spring coming in the physical uh, pain and symptoms, for example, that people feel. So let me give you an example of this, and we'll start with the physical. There, there's a certain um, sense of hollowness that people feel in the spring of their grief. There's an emptiness they feel because of the absence of of the the person. They might feel a tightness in their chest. It's not unusual, oftentimes to have this overlay if you already struggle with some anxiety to to have that 
again, kind of be a force multiplier to the tightness in the chest or the tightness in the throat or any of those kinds of things. And it, it just adds to and accentuates the, the intensity of those things. But those are very normal characteristics and traits of the spring of our grief. It, all these things that have been kind of dulled or numb during winter are awakening. And, and there, there are, even the characters in my book often wish for winter again. Because this awakening of feelings and, and the physical struggles that they might have is, is really worse in our mind, I think, than, than the dullness and the numbness that we feel before. Another good example is we, there's a certain oversensitivity to noise. It's like being overstimulated. And so the, there's a tendency during the spring to kind of isolate, pull away from people just to try to get your wits about you and to, to settle in on a little bit quieter because it just doesn't take much to, to kind of feel very overwhelming. Another one is, uh, at least in psychology, we, we call it depersonalization, where um, you know somebody once, once said, I walk down the street and nothing feels real, even including me. And so it's, it's depersonalizing. I, I don't feel like I'm really here or I'm walking through life and, and nobody knows that I'm here or things like that, that is very, very, very typical of the the spring of our grief um the the anxiety pieces of breathlessness or feeling short shortness of breath or things like that that oftentimes is anxiety again be careful because our tendency is to pathologize something that is entirely normal as humans going through grief and somewhere along the way, we've gotten the notion that if I, if I pathologize it, it's depression, anxiety, etc., then it's, it matters more. It's impo- more important versus this is the landscape of grief. And I'm actively in the mode of trying to acknowledge and work through what it is. So I see these characteristics and we don't have to jump too quickly to label them as depression or anxiety or, or like I said, whatever else it might be. <clears throat> now, if you have a history already going in, then probably, again, like I said, the anxiety becomes kind of a force multiplier of the grief that people are feeling because of how much we live in our heads which is an invitation into the world of shame because we make comparisons and we say, you know, I don't see other people having this kind of trouble. What's wrong with me? And that's the most profound statement of shame that you can find. It's not about what what I'm struggling with. It's not about that. Is there something fundamentally flawed in me that makes this so difficult? And there's some strange consolation to being able to label it that way, but it's still the voice of shame. And it's a fundamental rejection of being human, of missing, of of the sense of missing people and situations and missing having those kinds of dreams maybe that, that are so motivating to me because they organize our thoughts. And we really get in a bind when we forget about, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I'm actively in grief and that's what this is. And as I've said before, I, I can't count anymore how many times I've said to people, it's none of those things. This is called grief. This is called being a human, dealing with loss and experiencing grief. And that's what this is. So other physical symptoms you can add in is weakness in the muscles or a dry mouth or a lack of energy or a, you know apathy or lethargy might be another word we'd use. But all of those are very normal symptoms of grief. They're part of the picture. I, I have I've learned some news 
uh, actually it's the second time around on the news, uh, about a good friend who is struggling with terminal cancer. And I find myself doing some of these. I, it's not the oversensitivity to noise, maybe not, but I, I, I'm kind of absent minded and daydreaming about pretty much nothing at all, it seems like. But it's just, I, I, I'm in my head, just like anyone else would be, about the future and what could be and, and memories of the past. So we, so we split our time between the past and the future instead of living in the present, what we have right now. And that's very much a part of this active, how do I acknowledge what's there, be honest and specific about what it is, and allow it to exist, which I can't fight something I won't accept. Just make sure you catch that. And I say it a different way. Oftentimes, I can't change what I won't accept. I'm not going to recover from a grief I'm not willing to accept as there. I'm not. And so those are a few of the physical traits that people often have in the spring of our grief. The cognitive features, and again, like I said, this is how we think. This is how we frame things. This is how we understand and make sense of things. We, that's just inherently us as human to do such a thing. And the cognitive features includes the sense of disbelief. It's like, eventually I'm going to wake up and this is all going to be a bad dream. You probably have heard people say that, or maybe you said it. So there's a sense of disbelief. I can't believe this is happening, right? That's usually what we say. And the more that we lean in on that, the more it hampers us from responding to it as it is. Now, there is a downside to accepting it as it is. I recognize that. Because if I recognize that of what it actually is, acceptance, and then begin to work on that in terms of acceptance and identification and uh, kind of drawing near and asking questions of myself about what's going on with that, then I'm too close to it. And I again, I the misconceptions start to crop up, right? I, I feel like I'm going to get overwhelmed because I'm too close to it. So there's the disbelief, there's the disorientation or confusion people might feel. And like I said, the preoccupation or daydreaming or kind of being absent-minded and leaving your keys in the wrong place or whatever it might be, there are things that distract us and we're not even really paying attention to how they distract us or that they're even there to distract us. And that that's thoroughly part of this. It, the the Another one in cognitive features is some sense of a presence. Now, this is in the case of of uh, losing people to death, and and oftentimes people will say it's like it feels like they're with me, or they're looking over my shoulder, or they're watching me, or things like that. And that is a very, very, very normal feature in the spring of our grief. It's just it, it, it we have been so accustomed to that particular person being in our lives in that way that we're not going to let go of that just, you know, just with the flip of the coin or the flip of the switch and everything's going to be great. It do, it does not work that way. And it takes time for our internal systems, emotions and thoughts and and uh, orientating our uh, orient, orienting our behavior differently, all that, it takes time. It does. We are not going to do it overnight. And just willing ourselves to do it accomplishes nothing except inviting more shame because I can't perform well enough because I'm being held to a standard that can't be achieved. So, the sense of presence in in more extreme forms. Um, and a lot of times you'll have people that that have uh, preconditions before the loss ever occurred and some sense of getting visions. And sometimes in, in a normal sense, 
people will report a phantom experience where they feel like they've seen the person in uh, public. Or I remember as a kid, after my dad died, I still swore at times that I could hear the back door open at the time that he would get home from work. And he got home from work like clockwork. And, and so it's those kinds of things that are part of our cognition, how we see and think through things that is trying to make this shift to the reality that's different. And it, and it's not a matter of will. It's a matter of, and this is what's so upside down about it, because it's a matter of acceptance rather than will. Because if I accept it, then in time it will lose its power and it will it will fade away oftentimes so that's the cognition in terms of behaviors um, it's a lot of times you'll have people talk about sleep disturbances not being able to sleep or sleeping too much or things like that eating disturbances you'll see the same thing there eating too much eating too little forgetting to eat those are all part of it um, and and also just the complaint of emotional pain. Now, I, it's not like my pain receptors are firing, but John Bowlby, a theorist on uh, something called attachment, many, many years ago pointed to uh, behavior because he, he studied, basically studied Canadian geese, and they're monogamous. Once they choose a mate, they stay with that mate. And he identified what, what he called um, as uh, pining behavior. Now, if you ever see a, a, a pair, and maybe one of them's gotten hit by a car, you might see the mate on the side of the road. In a sense, look at watching over their mate, their body. And he referred to that as pining behavior. And that's, that's kind of the emotional pain and symptoms that we feel as humans because we have more sophisticated kind of thought process about things than, than obviously a goose does. I certainly hope so. And the other, the other one of behavioral things is just distraction, like I mentioned before. These, a lot of these are, if you're drawing a kind of a Venn diagram, there's a lot of things that overlap between all three of these kind of domains of behavior and cognition and uh, emotional output uh, and and things like that 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 you 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 can't just um, simply categorize because they're all overlapping. So, like I said, distracted and absent-minded behaviors or. The other one, which I, I'll end with, is the idea of social withdrawal. They'll isolate. And and in a lot of cases, when people ha- learn the first um, news of a loss, they will isolate from people or they'll lean into people. Some of that is, is just the nature of who they are and what they are prone to do uh, in terms of a verbal processing versus internal processing, introvert, extrovert. You can play around with those terms all you want. Uh, they probably lay out for us, I think, some propensities that we tend to engage in. Um, you know, even as <clears throat> as a young kid at 12 years old, when I was told that my dad died, I, I walked off, went into a room in the house I was staying in, and just closed the door behind me. It, and, it, you know, it's literally like somebody just blasted you with a bowling ball and and you're trying to clear your head of something you can't fit in it. So all of those are very much a part of it. Some of our strategies in light of these, so we talked about um, – uh, the behavioral disturbances, we talked about cognition, we talked about the physical set, uh, characteristics and traits that we have, but there are certain avoidance behaviors that oftentimes you will find people engage in during this spring of their grief, and and it's very simply just the avoidance of painful thoughts or situations. They just avoid it, and, and in a lot of cases, what you see is that they will empty th- their house of the things and the belongings of the person that they have lost, or they'll package them up, or they'll give them away. Um, and and 
that's that's a avoidance strategy of the the pain that they're feeling and they're experiencing. So there's that avoidance. Sometimes they'll they'll pack up and leave and go somewhere else. Geographical cures that we that we refer to, or as in my in my experience when I was a kid was the idealization of the of the person who's died um, and and so they they are memorialized in such a way that their flaws are kind of erased and all their greater qualities are emphasized now of course going through any kind of wake or funeral there's a eulogy right what does eulogy mean good word and and so there's an idealization of that of the of the person who's died and not a grasp or a grappling with the their flawedness and and when they're alive we don't think anything about it or criticizing it but when they're dead it's like i don't want to disrespect the dead right and i think being dishonest is disrespectful of the dead if you're asking me but you may not so it, it, it's something to keep in mind. And I think the avoidance strategies are really the ways that we go about trying to bring c- uh, control and order into what we feel is now very chaotic. And most of our efforts to do that is to minimize the pain. <clears throat> and so in, in winter, I, I, I've got to accept the loss that I have. And in spring, I've now moved into this place of, yeah, it's there, it hurts. What do I need to do to engage it in some way? And that's what brings us then to tools. Because the task is to identify and acknowledge the the loss and to begin to work through it. And working through it is such a psychological term and you hear people saying well I've just got to process it and I got to work through it and and you know in some sense it's 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 a very ambiguous term it's not very specific I mean how do we work through something one that we don't want to work through which is denial um, or how do we work through when we have no map we have no idea how to do that other than developing the awareness of the emotions that I have around the pain that I've experienced. And and that awareness is often hard to come by because, again, here comes that force multiplier of shame, is that when I feel it, <clears throat> I feel like I might be overly dramatic or I'm making a bigger deal out of it than it is or <clears throat> I might be a a burden to the people around me, any number of things. And it silences me instead of allowing me to open to trusted people, not just anybody, nobody. People need to show us that they're trustworthy before we trust them, not the other way around. I'm not going to make somebody trustworthy by entrusting to them something. I don't know how they're going to handle it, or I might. And I, I'm hoping to change that. So the tools, the tools of spring include continuing to journal, although journaling has to be a little bit more formatted, a little bit more specific about, um, you know, what am I thinking, how am I feeling, and what am I doing? And all of those are key terms of beginning to explore and acknowledge the pain that I'm experiencing and beginning to, uh, you know, make sense of it, where it comes from, who it's pointed toward. And, and from a Christian worldview or Christ following perspective, taking it into our relationship with Jesus. The one thing that has dawned on me and not dawned on me, I, I knew it all along, but it is absolutely remarkable to me that the prophet Isaiah prophesied about Jesus and he didn't call, in various places he referred to him, his kingship, okay? But there's another chapter in Isaiah that calls him 
a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, which is probably the most remarkable statement ever in the pantheon of Christ- Christianity or religious religions or anything. You don't hear that designation of any other God you hear. But Jesus was referred to a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, which means he is now acquainted with me, with my humanity. And that's what journaling oftentimes does. And instead of seeing your journal as just a travel log, a, you know, a reporting of things that have happened, why not turn it into a conversation with Jesus and complain? You can complain. You can get mad. And you can just feel really, really sad. And all of those things, he's willing to enter in with you because he's experienced it too. So journaling is really important. There are certain things along this, during this time that that can be done, like sorting through belongings, like um, communicating to others that it's okay that they talk about the person I've lost or the relationship I've lost or, um, you know, at... In, in the world I live in with college students is their ex uh, and because it's a relationship lost. But the other thing we have to contend with is, is dealing with guilt over the replay that we do of what we could have done, should have done, and didn't do. And we, we have to find a way to learn about accepting the grace that's offered us in being human, not an excuse, it is not an excuse, but accept the grace of being human and making mistakes and saying things and decoupling them from the, the um, uh, what do I want to say, the, the being a cause of whatever it is that happened, whether it's somebody has died or whatever. That's very common. We oftentimes say, you know, the last time I talked to them, I didn't say this, that, or the other thing, or I should have said that, and I could have, and and maybe it wouldn't have gone as badly as it did, and usually that's implied. So we have to deal with the mistakes that we've made, and that's that's the working through that I'm talking about with this, this uh, spring time of our grief. It might be seeing and noticing our own kind of faulty patterns of thinking that somebody helps us sort out. This is a great time for a counselor to have a trusted counselor who can sit and listen to your processing of it. And verbal processing is a big deal, partly because the minute you say it in in public, in front of another human, it is now officially yours. And so now you... Uh, um, now you own it, and now you begin to think about what do I need to do about it, if anything, really. Um, I, this is also a great opportunity to get involved in groups. Uh, grief groups, church, some churches will have something like that. Um, I certainly have ho- hope that we will begin to a, be able to develop some outpost grief groups, and they'll have to be online initially, but it will be an opportunity for people to sit down with a, a trained leader to facilitate these conversations. Um, and and the beauty of groups is that I can get some verification from other people about what healthy grief process looks like and and what I'm doing and doing some comparing to it. And then, you know, an, another thing that to be done during spring, and this is n- none of these, just be sure to know, None of these are once and done. We can return back to these off and on throughout, like allowing for some emotional purging. Uh, and, and that might be through journaling. That might be sitting with a counselor and, and you know, communicating our frustration or our, our anger at ourselves that, uh, without realizing how much shame there is in that, that I'm condemning myself for this instead of accepting the full brunt of my humanity and and also just little challenges along the way there are things in our thinking that we feel like things have happened to us 
And certainly when somebody dies, it feels like it's happening to us. It's not, it's not something that's a result of a choice of ours, although we keep looking for ways to take responsibility for it because then we know who to blame. But it, it very much is a part of, of the, the landscape here of some victim thinking patterns that, that begin to arise around here. And again, you have to have an extra set of eyes and ears and, and input to notice those things, somebody that can kind of frame it for you. And it doesn't, it, it doesn't take you know years and years of therapy to accomplish that. It, a good counselor can identify those things in, in a single meeting or and then by the time you get done with that meeting you're you're saying well maybe I should have some other meetings cuz this is really helpful for me to see how I'm I'm framing this stuff that really is not helpful for me or even working through some of the the grief that I have so so that's the spring the task is to acknowledge and work through the pain that we have the traits include physical traits behavioral traits um, uh, you know, emotional, certainly emotional traits, um, and, and, and behavioral ones, what we do and the avoidance strategies that come along with them. And so th- those are the traits. And then some tools include support groups or counseling or, uh, a journal or a meeting with some other people that have gone through the grief process as well. Um, in, in my book there, the, each person has been, um, Walk, found somebody to walk alongside of them. And that mentor's voice is the voice that helps them try to keep some perspective on it all. So that's the spring. We have two more seasons to go. They will be coming up soon. And that's uh, all for tonight. SGI-net.org is the home where you can find out everything about our SGI community. Please, please sign up just to be in the community. I'm not going to spam you with a bunch of email or anything. We we have just put together our newsletter uh, that you will get once a month, uh, updates of, of schedules on the podcast, some things that I've written over the years that you can read, um, and other, other reactions from people and a variety of things. There are a couple different places there where um, I'm writing something and then we have something called Food for Thought on the back back of it. So if you sign up, then we'll send it out and you can have it to, to chew on for a month and then we'll come up with a new one just to keep you up to date with the, the, the doings in um, – the SGI community. Uh, the other big item uh, to get on your calendar and and come is, and this will be on our social network sites as well, is uh, to make a reservation and come to our book launch event that is coming up on February 10th at 1.30 p.m. on the campus of CCU, Colorado Christian University, um, and you can you can reserve a spot to be there, and you can reserve a book to have it personalized and signed by me. So um, that we are doing that to just try to get a rough head count of the people that might be coming. Um, and please come. I'd love to to meet whoever is listening to these podcasts or wants wants a book. Um, you can hear a little bit from my publisher, who's a, who's a good friend, um, and a writer and author as well. Uh, and uh, I'll be reading some things, and then we can do a short Q and A just to to wrap it up. And then I'll be available to sign books. So we will have books on hand. If you want to buy it, you can get it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or sgi-net.org in. Uh, in the store, and you can buy a buy a book there. Uh, that that price is is helpful because it funds all of the other uh, you know all the other uh, activities that we're doing. Because we have silent retreats coming up this fall, we have three different ones coming up. Two of them are for CCU students, and a third one is for the general community of people that might be interested in participating in a silent retreat. Uh, you can check them out on the events page. If you have any questions about some of what I've talked about tonight, feel free to DM me your questions on Instagram. Uh, and subscribe. Subscribe to the to the uh, podcast. That just raises our profile. And if you think some of the things that you're hearing here are worthwhile for other people to hear, 
please pass it on and, and pass on even the, the link for the newsletter so people can see what's going on as we move forward into this brand new year. Uh, if you're looking for some inspiration for once a week, uh, you can find it in uh, Setting New Boundaries, Digital Devotional. Uh, well, once, once a week? Yeah, I think it's once a week. Uh, uh, and uh, you'll you'll have inspiration there as far as boundaries and healthy relationships and all manner of things. And, and you can uh, sign up for that on the website as well through paid resources. Um, so you can follow us on Instagram at SGI underscore international uh, on Facebook with Ray dot Mitch. And we keep your eye peeled, eyes peeled because we will be launching a SGI Facebook page that will also include the the seasons of our grief. Um, we'll include that group of people that might be reading and have questions or things like that. And then on LinkedIn at Dr. Mitch uh, M I T S C H. So <clears throat> um, the the podcast is available wherever you consume podcasts, uh, whether that's Spotify or iTunes or Amazon Music or wherever. If you know of anybody or if you are interested in partnering with us to continue to grow our scholarship fund for uh, for funding people that can't afford to go on our silent retreats or for students that can't afford to go on them, uh, we would be ever so grateful and thankful uh, for your uh, donation and gift for that. All of your gifts are tax deductible. Uh, SGI is a tax exempt organization tax, so all of your uh, donations are tax deductible. Um, and so you can do that there on the website under the donate drop down. Or if you'd rather send us a, a physical check, you certainly can do that and send it uh, to uh, SGI. P.O. Box uh, 322, East Lake, Colorado, 80614. A uh, couple other things I'll just highlight for you. You've got a brand new window sticker that if you're interested and you're watching, i got to reach for it, and you're watching on the video, you'll see uh, the brand new window sticker coming up. That's 5 bucks. Uh, not not terribly expensive, but every little bit helps along the way. So as I mentioned before, the book launch is coming up on 21024 at 130. Be sure to sign up on our event right to let it let us know whether you're coming and whether you're interested in a book. Um, and I think that is enough. I was going to say that's it, but I think that's enough. So Thanks so much for listening to me tonight. Thanks for your uh, devotion and willingness to consider some of the ideas around grief and some a new way of thinking about it. I pray that you will uh, come back. I'll be here waiting for you next time. And until then, love you. Later. Bye. Bye.